Welcome to AP Chemistry at Hananiga High School. Today we'll be looking at our last set of notes related to Chapter 7. Look at the last three sections. 7.6 gets into properties of metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. In order to understand the differences between these two things, we really need to talk about metallic character. Now, metallic character refers to the extent to which the element exhibits the physical and chemical properties of metal. So metallic character is to act like a metal. Well, what is the single most important thing to be a metal? Well, think about what metals do. On our periodic table, all metals are the stuff on the left side of the periodic table, and they form cations. Well, to form a cation, that means you need to lose electrons. So at its core, what you really need to be the best metal you could be is the ability to lose metal or to lose electrons easily. So in other words, metallic character is how easily you lose electrons. Do it really well, you're a metal. Do it terrible, then you're going to be a non-metal. Now we look at the trends of metallic character on the periodic table. You can see that it increases down a column. So group trend increases. And the period trend, it decreases when you go to the right across the periodic table. So fundamentally, that means the most metallic substances would be in the lower left-hand corner because metallic character increases when you go to the left and metallic character increases when you go down. So francium would be our most metallic substance on the periodic table, which means it's phenomenal at losing electrons, which means it's incredibly hard to actually isolate Francium-1, it's a very low incidence element, so there's not a high percent abundance of francium out there. And two, what makes it even more complicating is francium will react with anything to lose its electrons. So to actually isolate it and see in its metallic form would be near impossible. So we've get, proved the existence that francium exists, but we've never isolated it and seen it as a substance. Now, metal versus nonmetals. Collectively, and this is something you got into in pre -chem P chemistry, so you should understand the basic differences between metals and nonmetals. And the differences tend to resolve around the properties of how well and how easily you lose electrons. Metals are shiny. Um, well, that deals with how easily they reflect energy and lose electrons. They're, as a solid, malleable and ductile, which means you can bend them and mold them. So the bonding that takes place in metals um, really, and this is metallic bonding we'll get you into in future chapters, involves the ease with which electrons move around in metals. It also makes them great conductors. And most metal oxides and ionic comp um, are ionic solids that are basic. We're actually not going to get into that. When we did more descriptive chemistry and had to do the writing reactions and answering questions about them, that was a much more important idea on the AP test. Um, and the last one, tend to form cations and aqueous solutions. That's an important idea to understand. Yes, you should understand metals form cations. Nonmetals, on the other hand, they are not lustrous. They're brittle, not malleable. Um, they're poor conductors of heat and electricity. Um, those are types of things you should understand about nonmetals. And they form uh, anions and oxyanions, so oxygenated anions. So those are some properties of metals and nonmetals that you should have a working understanding of for the test. Now, one of the things that you should understand about metals is they tend to form cations and nonmetals tend to form anions. That really splits them into where they're on the periodic table. The stuff on the left are things that form cations. Stuff in the upper right are the things that form anions. So, properties of metals, we already got into this. They're shiny. You can see how the gold here um, is a shiny, and the, the uh, brownish-looking stuff, that would be copper. Lustrous, malleable, good conductors of heat electricity. Uh, metals tend to be oxidized, which means they lose electrons. Remember, um, oil rig oxidizes a loss of electrons when they react. So metals are very good at losing electrons. Compounds formed between metal, metals and nonmetals form ionic compounds. You've got something that wants to gain, something that wants to lose. They form cations and anions, and you get an ionic compound. If you put a metal together with a nonmetal, it's a fairly simple synthesis reaction, and you should be able to predict this type of reaction. So we're not, while we're not doing quite as much reaction writing for the AP test in the current form, this is something that is fundamental, and you should be able, easily able to do this. Remember, the stuff on the left, those are... Um, elemental substances and their formula is not about charge, but about whether they're diatomic or not. The Han Fickelbry, the diatomic seven. However, you need to remember that hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine are all diatomic. 
most everything else in the periodic table is monatomic. And then on the right side, we're forming compounds, ionic compounds. That's all about charges. And remember, you can look on the periodic table and the position it's in to figure out what kind of charge it's going to form. And don't forget, yes, sodium can get together with hydrogen to form sodium hydride. And now hydrogen, which is our nonmetal, it has to be, even though it's in group one and normally would be a plus one, like when we look at it with acids, it's going to be a minus one charge here. Nonmetals, on the other hand, exact opposite. They're dull, they're brittle, they're poor conductors of heat and electricity. They tend to gain electrons in redox reactions um, to acquire a noble gas configuration. Uh, there are seven monatomic or non-metallic elements that exist as diatomic substances. You should know all of these from pre-AP chemistry. Very important to know it again this year. And substances containing only nonmetals, well, they're usually molecular compounds. There is one exception, ammonium compounds. Ammonium is NH4+, and it's all nonmetals. But in every other situation outside of that, then you're going to be dealing with molecular compounds. And remember, one of the most important class of molecular compounds is the hydrocarbon, the combination between carbon and hydrogen. Metalloids. Don't spend a long time with these because they're really just substances that kind of act like metals and kind of act like nonmetals. So they have properties of each. So for instance, you're looking at a picture of silicon. Silicon is really shiny, but it's very, very brittle. Hit it with a hammer and it acts like a nonmetal. But it is shiny and it's also a fairly poor conductor. So it does conduct, but it's kind of in between metals and nonmetals. But it does conduct a little. It's a semiconductor. Now, the next couple of sections in your book getting into understanding some fundamental groups on the periodic table. There are some groups that act enough like families that they get their own family names and you should have a working understanding of some of them off the periodic table. So in the first section, I think this is section 6.7, we're going to be looking at the first couple of columns of metals, the alkali metals and the alkaline earth metals. Now alkali metals are soft metallic solids. So most of these can be cut with a knife. So you can literally push on it and slice right through it. Um, the name for alkali metals comes from the Arabic word meaning ashes. When you dissolve ashes in water, they usually make the water a little bit basic. Well, these metals, when you put them in water, end up making the metals or the water solution basic as well. Alkaline is the old name for basic. So they're called alkali metals because when you throw them in water, they make the water basic. They also bubble and fizz and release hydrogen gas. Now, they're found only in compounds in nature, not in their elemental form, because they're so good at losing electrons. They will do it with pretty much anything. So you're never going to find alkali metals in their natural form because they're so reactive. Now, they also have very low densities and melting points. Well, if you think about the situation here, um, density, that's the ratio of mass to volume. Well, when you have things that lose electrons very easily, um, they are going to have very low ionization energies. So low ionization energies means they're very easy to lose electrons. So the reactivities of this class of substances is really tied to their low ionization energy. And when you move down the group, they get lower and lower ionization energies, which means they become more and more and more reactive. So sodium re will react with water. Um, potassium reacts violently with water and rubidium even more so. So as you go down, their reactivities increase. And that's tied to their ionization energies and how easy it is for them to lose electrons. And you can also see here that there is a, a definite relationship with team melting, point, melting and boiling point. So that must mean that they're not holding on to each other as well. So their volume can increase, making low density, and they're easy to push apart. So the metallic bonding that they have must be lower than in other situations with metals. Now, one thing I'd mentioned briefly uh, was that alkali metals will react wa with water violently to make the water basic and release hydrogen gas. And if it reacts violently enough, because this is exothermic, it can actually cause that hydrogen gas to combust because hydrogen is an explosive gas. So one of the things you often see with alkali metals is a reference to them reacting with water. They're highly reactive substances. Even throwing them in water, they'll react to make a metal hydroxide and hydrogen gas. Now, another thing about alkali metals, and this is just something I wanted to point out, is they behave differently. Um, this is tied to, remember the uh, electric pickle? 
We said sodium uh, is yellowish in color because of the electron drop that happens in its sublevels, is the visible part of the spectrum in the yellow range. Well, I'd mentioned that other substances will react with different colors. So lithium is kind of a reddish color. Um, potassium is kind of a purplish color. So not only do they react differently, but they also have different colors when you burn them or when you pass electricity through them. Now, the next class of metals that get their own name would be the alkaline earth metals. Alkali, shorter name, next column over alkaline earth metal, long name. That's one way to remember that we're talking about the second column in the periodic table. Now, alkaline earth metals have higher densities and melting points than alkali metals, uh, but they're still relatively null compared to the stuff as you go to the right on the periodic table. So they must be held together and bonded a little bit more strongly in their metallic bonding. They're also not quite as high in reactivity. Well, that's because their ionization energies are low, but not as low as those are in the, as the alkali metals. But as you go down, it still would be true that they tend to increase in reactivity because once again, as the ionization energy gets lower, it's easier and easier to remove electrons. Now we're going to skip in the last section of the chapter to our nonmetals. Now the first group of nonmetals is 6A, and while this does have a name, uh, usually we just refer to it as the oxygen family because unlike some of our other families that have names that are worth remembering and we use them, when you look at the oxygen family, they're a pretty dysfunctional family. As you move down the oxygen family, we actually go across the stair steps that separates our non-metals form our metals. So within one family, we have oxygen, sulfur, and selenium, which act as non-metals, tellurium, which is a metalloid, and then polonium at the bottom, which is a radioactive, highly reactive metal. So this is a pretty dysfunctional family. Um, but it's worth mentioning because oxygen is one of our very common substances. And this is one of the few families that really moves across the stair steps, steps significantly and has some in one family, some of each of the different types of metals, non-metals, and metalloids. Now, our next column is halogens. Really important when you're going to hear that name referred to a lot. Halogens would be our group 17, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. They're our prototypical. In other words, they're, they behave like what we would expect non-metals to behave like. Um, the name for halogens actually comes from the Greek word for halos and uh, Genoa. I'm probably butchering that in Greek. Uh, but they're salt formers. So when you put them together with a metal, they form non-metal salts. Halogens are things that have very high electronegativity, something I briefly talked about in the last set of notes, which means they hold on to electrons really well and they grab electrons really well. So they're great oxidizers. So they're really easily reduced. They're great at making metals oxide, oxidize. And they react directly with metals to form metal halides. And since this is a simple um, synthesis reaction, you should be able to predict some of those uh, reaction formulas for those synthesis reactions. Last thing I want to mention, because this is kind of a common thing, chlorine is one of the halogens, and chlorine is routinely put in water, and that actually forms uh, a, um, a toxic situation for living organisms. Well, in very small quantities, really tiny living organisms like bacteria, um, can be killed. So it's a, a great disinfectant. So we actually put small quantities of, of chlorine in most of our drinking water uh, to kill bacteria that might be in there. And the reason it works so well is when it leaves the, the plant that added the chlorine, it's protected. So if somewhere downstream some bacteria get exposed to the water, um, they can be killed as well. So chlorine is actually added to water supplies often to serve as a disinfectant. We also chlorinate our pools for the same reason, to kill the bacteria and the viruses that may be there. Last group we're going to talk about is the noble gases. Noble gases pop up a ton. They're a very important family on the periodic table for their ability really not to react with other gases, so their inability to react. Noble gases have astronomical ionization energies, massive ionization energies, which means they are very unlikely to lose electrons and be involved in reactions. Hence, they're noble gases. They're inert. They don't react with other uh, substances in routine reactions. And that's really related to their very high ionization energies. So they're largely unreactive. Now, the family as a whole are all gases. So they're non-metallic 
monatomic gases. And that's how they exist under most conditions. But it wasn't long before scientists realized under the right conditions, we actually can get noble gases to react. So to say they're completely unreactive is not actually true. There are a few, a very, very, very few limited number of noble gases that can react and form compounds. Now, as you look at the noble gases, they become slightly more reactive as you go down because of the decrease in ionization energy. Remember, one of the reasons why they're not reactive is they have massive ionization energies. Well, a trend in ionization energy decreases as you go down as you get farther from the nucleus. So it would make sense <coughs> that substance is at the very, very bottom. Now we're skipping the radioactive, um, unstable radon and going to something like xenon. Xenon actually forms three different compounds on the periodic table. Now notice they're all reacting with fluorine, which is our greatest thing at stealing electrons. It's our most electronegative substance. So it's not a surprise that most of the time when we get these things to react to make a compound, we're looking at a fluorine type situation. But notice we have three compounds that um, xenon can form with fluorine. Krypton does have one known compound, and we found an, one for argon in the year 2000, so relatively recently. Highly unstable type of compound, but we can make it exist, and it does exist for a short period of time. So as you go up, they're getting less and less and less reactive. So we do say that noble gases are non-reactive, but that's not 100% true. They're just by and large non-reactive in normal situations. And that ends our chapter seven notes.